All right, I think we're ready to get started. Welcome everyone to our final webinar in our zero waste video series, The Scoop on Poop and Other Unmentionables from, from Sustainable Resilient Longmont's Zero Waste Committee. Sustainable Resilient Longmont is a nonprofit organization that collaborates with the Longmont community to cultivate a sustainable and thriving city through education, advocacy, and action. We have three main programs of focus. We put on the annual Longmont Earth Day celebration. We work to achieve 100% renewable energy by 2030 for the city of Longmont. And we advocate for the Longmont community to move towards becoming zero waste. My name is Naomi Kurland, and I'm the chair of the Zero Waste Committee for SRL. The topic of this webinar was first conceived of last August when we connected with a representative from the cloth option. And I am so glad that we are finally able to share the sustainable alternatives to single use disposables with our greater online community. First, we'll be hearing from Rosie Briggs, who will give us an overview of the various waste streams we create in conjunction with our biological waste. Rosie is the Community Education and Engagement Manager at EcoCycle, Boulder County's recycler and national zero waste pioneer nonprofit. Rosie has worked in the recycling and zero waste field for eight years and would love to answer any recycling or composting questions you have. After Rosie, Rebecca Cox will share a wealth of information about cloth diapers. Rebecca works with the cloth option to promote and educate families about cloth diapers as one waste reduction strategy. She also educates about other sustainable, reusable hygiene products and how to launder them. Next, Rose Seaman will take us through the impacts of our pet waste and how we can make more sustainable choices for our four-legged friends. Rose is the owner of EnviroWag, a company that composts dog waste from Boulder Trailheads, dog parks, and dog daycares in the Denver metro area. Rose is also an organizer of Enviro Pet Waste Network, a new nonprofit connecting people around the world to share information and experiences of eco-friendly programs to manage pet waste. Uh, Rose did call me today and said that her internet in her whole neighborhood is down. So it may get fixed within this next hour and she may pop on by video, but if not, she'll be calling in a little later so that she can present on pet waste. And then finally, I will finish things off with a variety of menstrual products that are safe and comfortable alternatives to single use tampons and pads. So uh, before we get started, I wanted to mention that we have our Q&A open at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So if you'd like to ask a question of our panelists, please type it into the pop-up Q&A box and we'll have time to discuss your questions after our panelists' presentations. Uh, we're gonna start things off by learning a little about our waste streams and the impacts of single-use disposables. So I will turn things over to Rosie Briggs from EcoCycle. Great, thank you so much, Naomi. Um, excited to be here. I remember us talking about this topic long ago, so I'm also excited because I don't think I've ever done a webinar on this specific topic, which I've done a lot, and so this is exciting. I will go ahead and share my screen and then start talking for real. Computers being real sleepy right now. All right. Okay, great. Um, so Naomi already introduced me, um, but my name is Rosie Briggs. I work for EcoCycle. EcoCycle is the local recycler for Boulder County. Anytime you put anything in the recycling bin, it comes to the Boulder County Recycling Center uh, where we will sort it and then send it off to where it will go to turn into something new. Um, we also work on a whole bunch of legislation, infrastructure, composting, all of that stuff for any, reducing, reusing anything about waste. 
So um, I have at the end a slide with my email so that you can reach out to me with any general recycling and composting questions. But uh, obviously we're gonna be talking about um, poop and uh, menstrual products and um, diapers today. So that's what I will just be giving a brief uh, overview on um, just from the waste stream uh, perspective. Um, and the cloth option and EnviroWag, I'm big fans of both of them. They, they will both have um, more in-depth things to say about each of these. So I'm just gonna kind of give a, a recyclers and composters uh, perspective on these things. So uh, we're gonna start with diapers. Um, so in terms of volume, what we're talking about here is there's an estimated 20 billion, with a B, disposable diapers added to landfills just in the US just each year. Oh, can you not hear me? Oh, you can't, okay, sorry, <laughs> I get paranoid. Okay, um, so that's, that's way too many. I can't even conceptualize 20 billion, but um, here I have this picture that for some reason is really low quality, but this is 500 diapers. Um, so imagine if that's 500, imagine what 20 billion looks like in a landfill or in the environment every year, just in this country. Um, so it creates 3.5 million tons of waste. Again, that's hard for me to even picture, but I know that it's way too many, it's a lot. <laughs> Okay, uh, and then so again, from um, from EcoCycle's point of view, uh, we talk about plastics all day long. I personally talk about plastics all day long and plastics comes into play in a big way here. It's not, um, you know, when we talk about single use plastics, we're often talking about things like straws, you know, candy wrappers, plastic bottles, things like that. Um, when really pl single use plastics is a huge category because so many products, really the majority of products out there contain plastics in some way. Um, and diapers are certainly no exception. So when you look at the content of, of most single use diapers, uh, we see a lot of familiar faces in the plastic world. So polyethylene, um, which is you know very common type of plastics found in things like water bottles, um, polypropylene, which is like your yogurt tub, and then polyester, or a poly, um, polyester, which is you know found in clothing. So um, I think a lot of times when we look at something that looks like a diaper, that's not like a hard plastic or like crunchy plastic thing, uh, we think that it's not necessarily plastic when in fact it's all of the same plastics that we're talking about when we talk about single use plastics and the, um, the problems that they're co posing for our environment. Um, the other thing is that, so landfills aren't a vacuum. We like to think to, that um, in just in waste in general, we like to think that there's an away you know, when you put something in a bin, whatever bin it is, you like to think that it's just like, it's gone. And most people really do think that they really don't know where anything goes, what happens to it, whether you put it in the landfill, recycling or compost. Um, so it's really important to familiarize ourselves with where our stuff is going so that we can work on why we're throwing those things away in the first place. Um, so landfills are very carefully designed. Um, they do, you know, they're engineered. There's a whole bunch of things in place to uh, you know, prevent various health and environmental problems, but they're not perfect. They're not a perfect vacuum. So um, an EPA study, for example, um, found that uh, diapers, single use diapers in the landfill pose a problem um, in terms of pathogens leaking into groundwater, for example. Um, and then the other thing is just decomposition. We think that things decompose in the landfill um, when in fact landfills, because of those many environmental and healthy, um, environmental and health safety precautions. Um, they're designed to be land, uh, <laughs> airtight, not land tight. Uh, they're designed to be airtight. So um, they, they wanna pack everything in and they want to uh, make sure that things don't get out, which of course they do sometimes do. Um, but because of that, things really don't decompose in the landfill. Um, things, especially organic things need um, oxygen to decompose and they don't have that. And so even if, you know, single use diapers and I'll talk about this with menstrual products as well, contain organic products, organic materials like you know paper and, and cotton, they won't break down, they won't decompose. Um, they'll take hundreds of years to decompose and even then it'll be in the form of microplastics and, um, and you know, other things that we don't want to be leaching into the environment. So, um, and when we, whenever you hear some, like a statistic that's like, it will take hundreds of years, like that's, a, that's an estimate because plastics haven't been around for hundreds of years, so we don't know. Like we, we, they're not going to be gone in our lifetime, but we don't even know. Sorry, the sun is like right behind my head. Oh, that made it worse. I'm just going to go back. Isn't this professional? All right. God. <laughs> We're going to, I'm sorry, guys. 
There we go. Okay, great. Great. All right. Uh, so now just moving on to pet waste really quickly. So, um, oh. Oh, great. Okay. My text got mixed up. Cool. Well, I had a statistic about um, <laughs> about uh, dog waste. Um, I'm sure that Rose from EnviroWag will have many statistics, but I will just give kind of my um, my general take on dog waste. Um, we all, you know, especially in like Boulder County, for example, we have so many dogs here. Everyone has a dog and everyone is obsessed with their dogs. And many of us, you know, in this area are also very environmentally minded. So it's really hard um, to kind of have the, both of those things um, be part of the culture here. So, um, you know, dogs just create an en enormous amount of waste and most of it goes to the landfill. Once again, um, organics in the landfill will not break down. They won't decompose. They won't turn into, you know, compost um, because they don't have that um, access to oxygen. And what happens when you put an organic material into the landfill, which is that airtight environment, um, rather than break down uh, as aerobic decomposition, which is what happens when something breaks down into compost, it undergoes anaerobic decomposition, which means that it breaks down not only super slowly, but it also emits methane. Um, as a result, and methane just is a powerhouse of a greenhouse gas that, um, you know, it has a heat trapping capability of 82 to 86 times uh, what CO2 does for heat trapping, which is, you know, we talk about CO2 a lot as a greenhouse gas, but methane is something we really need to get under control. So currently things like, you know, this loads and loads of dog poop uh, in the landfill are emitting methane because they're, they're not able to break down in the way that they literally were designed to by by nature. Um, the other thing is that we put them in plastic bags. And again, I'll say, you know, it says an estimated 700 to 1000 years. That's just basically means it won't break down, right? Like, <laughs> um, we these plastic bags will turn into microplastics. Um, all the while the poop is emitting methane. The the short story is, is that it's not good. It's not a good system currently that we're sending all this dog waste to the landfill. But of course, we also want to be mindful of the, of, again, the pathogen, um, uh, you know, situation <laughs> and the health and safety aspect of dog poop. Uh, and then, so kitty litter, um, do I have a different, yeah, there it is, okay. I do have the picture. I don't know what happened to the words. Uh, so kitty litter is the other thing. I have a kitty. I'm a huge kitty person. Um, so the that poses its own problem. So not only do we talk about, you know, the waste itself, but we have to talk about what we're, <laughs> what comes along with the waste. So with dog poop, it's usually just the plastic bag. Um, and by the way, if you are, if you're buying a compostable bag for your dog poop, but it still has to go in the trash, um, you know, it's good to disengage with plastics upstream, but that, that compostable bag isn't going to come, it's not going to compost, you know, um, as I said. So using like a reused bag, if it has to go into the landfill, it's a good way to go. Um, so anyway, kitty litter. So kitty litter, a lot of it is made of clay, which has to be strip mined. So what that means is we have to go into um, some sort of natural environment and scrape off all the, um, all the fauna, um, I mean, flora. Wow, you guys, once it hits 5 p.m., I can't talk anymore. So we have to scrape off all the living things there. So plants and grass and trees, um, and then, you know, destroy habitat for whoever's living there. And then we uh, blast a big hole in it to get to the clay. Um, and so not only is that, you know, not only are we talking about the downhill, downstream effects of, um, of this waste, but we have to think about the upstream effects as well. Um, where are we getting these materials? And that goes for the entire waste um, conversation, not just pet waste, just anything you think of comes from something like this. It's a, a huge hole in the earth and um, using up natural resources. Uh, and then clay also is not good at decomposing is the other thing. So uh, kitty litter, there's a huge, um, you know, there's a huge spectrum of like natural stuff and then like really chemically stuff because of smell. Um, like there's microplastics in some of it. There's just um, a huge variation in it. So it's hard to talk about what to do with it when there's not one uniform type of kitty litter. So that's my take on kitty litter. Okay, and then menstrual products. Uh, lastly, we have this really gross picture of all of the single use plastics. It just seems like we have so many products that like worked for us for so many years. And then in the last few decades, we were like, slap some plastic on it. 
wrap it in plastic and then add some more plastic. And that's what happened with tampons. So um, in the United States alone, again, only talking about this country, approximately 12 billion with a B pads and 7 billion tampons with a B are discarded each year. So, um, you know, a lot of them are made of, thing, you know, cotton um, and, you know, it matters if the cotton is organic or not to the environment, but uh, more than that, it usually contains plastic as well. So, you know, when they have all the fancy ads with the braided tip and then the thing that goes like this and like that's because they design it with all of this additional um, material. So a lot of them contain plastics. You know, you, if you picture a pad, you can picture literally the plastic on the back of it. Um, and again, um, <laughs> that's just more single use plastics um, and something that historically probably didn't have to happen. Um, and then the applicators is the other thing, like putting the, putting it in the plastic applicator. Obviously, um, I understand that there are benefits similar to a straw where like some people may need um, that feature um, in order to use the product. But in many cases, I don't think we need that much plastic. Um, and then, you know, there's the plastic wrapper and everything. Um, on Shark Tank, I saw that they pitched their there were two men that pitched a product that was literally just a pink plastic glove for you to handle your own tampon with and then they got money for it so anyway we love to add plastic to things um so then again so some of them go to landfills um you know a lot of menstrual products just end up in the trash where they emit methane like i said so if they're made of cotton um that's an organic material which would you know hypothetically break down because the planet is good at breaking down what it made um but in the landfill again it's just emitting methane it's not it's undergoing anaerobic decomposition because of that lack of oxygen but others get flushed so like that's something that i didn't realize happened for a long time but a lot of people do flush their um, menstrual products which contributes of course to our growing microplastics crisis in the ocean so we have an, an immense crisis if you're not aware of plastics um little itty bitty pieces of plastic um, that are getting into the ocean and then you know killing fish and then we eat the fish and then we get have it in our bodies we drink the water um and you know tampons and pads are part of that certainly and then as i said uh, tampon applicators and wrappers um also often end up as litter which can be ingested by wildlife and again just break down um outside of the ocean on land and cause uh, microplastic pollution as well so that was dismal, and I'm hoping that uh, the, the other three speakers will have really great, exciting solutions and innovations, which I know that they do. Um, but I just put my email here. Um, so if you have questions about recycling or composting or anything zero waste, just in general, you can always shoot me an email. Um, and EcoCycle is happy to help with any of those questions. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rosie. So if any, any attendees have questions about our waste streams or EcoCycle for Rosie, you can use that Q&A form at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we'll get to them at the end of the presentations. And we'll also share some EcoCycle links in the Zoom chat if you're interested in learning more about that organization. Uh, now we are going to get into those sustainable solutions. So Rebecca Cox is going to start things off with cloth diapers. Hi, thanks everyone for again, putting this on. Um, I'm excited, very excited to get to present this information. We get, we get asked so many questions and it's hard to answer with one singular answer because cloth is very versatile and adaptable. And that's actually why it's such a great solution. So diving in, we're gonna go ahead and share screens. Why is it not letting me share that? There we go. All right. So this is um, my first presentation about um, cloth diapers, just in general. So diving in to that aspect um, of why choosing cloth. They're obviously more comfortable for baby because you don't have plastic trapped against baby, making them sweat. So you get fewer diaper rashes because less sweat means less heat rashes, among other things. Babies tend to potty train sooner 
um, six months on average. Um, that's actually typically probably because the plastics are so good at absorbing the wetness that the baby doesn't actually feel that they're wet. Whereas the cloth diaper, um, you know, holds their wetness, but keeps it against them so they can actually feel I've, I've soiled myself. And if I want to be clean, I cannot do that. Um, more economical because this diaper has been used 238 times, not once. Um, no landfill waste, because then I take this to EcoCycle and they compost it because it's just cotton. All right, <clears throat> that's one baby. That's approximately six diapers a day for just two and a half years. 5,600 disposable diapers. Now, let's do some math. Let's have two children. Now we're at 11,000. Oops, wrong way. Come on, buddy, wrong way. There's my fingers, sorry guys. Our cloth diaper's really cheaper. Uh, most people can save upwards of $1,700 because cloth can be used for up to, well, any number of children at this point. Um, it says two to three, but um, then we're the cloth option and we make them last even longer. Um, come on, here we go. Cloth diapers do also have resale value. So that's um, something to keep in mind. A lot of the brands made in the United States, especially, um, have a higher quality and like tend to last a little longer. So they have a higher resale value. They also cost a little more. So they have a, a resale value. Um, even when factoring in electricity, water and detergent, the savings are great. Um, and the only exception being a laundry service. If you pay for a laundry service, it might not be cheap, but it's still much better for the environment. How much are you spending on diapers? Again, we talk about savings and costs. Price per diaper, sure, our diapers cost more, but they get thrown away a lot less. Um, but personally, I haven't spent $800 to cloth diaper my child. Um, I've spent about 350, maybe 400. All right, I'm gonna really quickly go through these because this is, widely available on the internet, types of cloth diapers. There's all-in-ones. These are really easy, actually. Very easy for parents that um, are using a, a daycare or a caregiver that might feel more comfortable with something similar to a disposable diaper. Um, there are no additional parts to it. It's just like a, I don't like the term disposable diaper either. It's just like a plastic diaper. All right, here we have pockets on twos and hybrids. So again, just um, different types of cloth diapers, but the hybrids and all in twos are, are an interesting kind because they offer a lot of different brands offer um, a cloth option and then a disposable option that works in there too that is like compostable or biodegradable, much more so than a, a plastic diaper that's made that says it's compostable and it's not. Um, Pre-folds, fitteds, contours, flats, and covers. So these, I think, technically they're the most eco they're the most economical, certainly, but they are the most environmentally friendly also because they re they require the least amount of plastics. Um, they're very inexpensive, um, very easy to launder because it's a giant sheet or a small but thick sheet um and it's easy to make sure baby doesn't get wet <sighs> these are just materials that go into pocket diapers or covers um i will say this cloth isn't perfect but any step in the right direction that we can make um is progress right but um one of our biggest culprits 
of plastic used in cloth diapers is our microfiber inserts. Um, but again, they do have uses and I, or, or they can be used multiple times. And I, um, they also don't have to be used. You can use other options. So bamboo, cotton, and hemp are other options. You do have to watch for bamboo um, because it can still contain plastics sometimes, but cotton and hemp won't. Um, how many do I need to get started? So this is just a quick math problem. Um, generally 12 per day uh, at first for a newborn times how many days you wanna wash. So 12 times two, if you wanna wash every other day, um, which for a newborn I find um, pretty practical because you're still kind of home. And as much as you maybe don't want to be thinking about doing laundry, you kind of already are because you just got spit up on and then they peed through their diaper and then they spit up on their onesie and then they, you burp them. And then, so anyway, um, <laughs> and then again, as baby gets older, they use less, they, they soil less frequently. So they um, use less diapers throughout the day and they also use um, a diaper longer at night. So, yeah, 12 to 15, as the baby gets older, you need less. Um, that does differ, stop, versus um, which style of diapers, so pocket diapers, because um, of the way the materials are, I consider them single soil um, reusable diapers, because um, once baby poos or pees in them, you do have to wash them. So the only um, difference there is with fitteds or prefolds and flats like this. Um, you can just put a plastic cover over it. Well, then you can just take this out and the plastic is wipeable. And so you can reuse that cover, um, which I also yes, have the covers here. So, um, and that's what it's explaining here where if you were using pockets, you'd need 12 to 15 shells and 12 to 15 inserts. You know, but you could get away with three to four covers or with 12 to 15 inserts or 12 to 15 prefolds, et cetera. Throwing cloth diapers. Um, I won't really dive too much into this, but I think it's actually a key uh, component to mention that the key for stink-free diapers is actually airflow. A lot of people think that um, trapping the smell in is how you're gonna contain the smell, right? They're like, oh, but what, how do you deal with the poop? And what about the smell? Well, airflow is the key. And uh, again, Rosie touched on that, that the organic material needs airflow to really break down and not turn into, oh, oh, oh the horror. So, uh, but we do use wet bags that um, also are useful for a variety of other um, uses because they can be used for sw wet swim clothes or whatever. Um, but you can honestly just toss them in an open laundry basket and give them airflow. Uh, washing diapers. So again, synthetic diapers, the ones that are made of plastic, you don't have to wash them to like press the material or anything. It's pretty good to go. Natural fibers um, like cotton and hemp, you do sometimes need to wash them like four or five times to prep them, but you can still use them. They just won't reach their max absorbency until they're washed a little bit more and those fibers really open up and start absorbing. Um, but they can be washed with other laundry to prep. Um, and yeah, I'll dive into pre-loved diapers to be sanitized further. We'll skip that for now. But washing poop, um, it's important to mention that exclusively breastfed babies, their poop is water soluble. So when before baby is introduced to solid foods, if baby is not introduced to formula, um, you can just toss those into the wash without having to do anything. Um, if the baby is formula fed, or once you enter, once you introduce solids, their waste isn't as well isn't water soluble, and so um, we start using sprayers or liners, different ways to get the poop into the toilet without touching the poop. Um, personally, I use a sprayer and I also have like my, these are my cloth diaper gloves. And then I have a little spray shield and I just clip a diaper on and spray and ew, and I don't have to touch anything. It's just like washing dishes for me. Um, and then when you're washing, the main thing with, with cloth diapers is that you have to do two wash cycles. And it's not just your pre-wash on your washing machine. It's two wash cycles. 
but the first one is your pre-wash because you do have pee and poo in there, urine and feces, human waste in there. So when you're washing that first go round, human waste is now in the water and it's gonna go away with the water to be treated as a water treatment facility. But let's wash it again so that we're washing with clean water and have a good, nice, clean, sanitary diaper for baby. Um, what the slideshow mentions is you want long cycles with full amounts of detergent to make sure you're getting diapers clean. You can line dry diapers or put them in the dryer. Um, I do both. Choosing a detergent. So detergents, um, mainstream detergents do work very well with diapers um, because they also contain other like uh, enzymes and um, water softeners. But plant-based and free and clear detergents can also be used. You just sometimes have to use more or and or use water softener. Here again, we're talking about water softeners with hard, hard water considerations. Um, we have hard water here. And in order to prevent mineral buildup, um, we have to use water softeners. So borax, borax or Calgon both work. Um, dun, 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 determine, oh yeah, we can skip all of this. Um, Although I guess I can pull it back up so everyone can read it for a second. But this is all very, this is where it depends. We, we test our water. And if your water falls into these ranges, this is what you do to deal with the fact that water is. So what happens when your water is hard is um, your detergent is trying to attach itself to the extra minerals in the water and doesn't attach itself to the extra things it's trying to get out of your clothes. So. It can also, like hard water does affect your regular laundry. It can lead to dingy wipes and things like that. Um, so again, this is just washing, washing, washing. Um, but I will, I'm gonna stop on this because I hear this a lot. Proper agitation is so key and this ties into other reusable products because what I do is I do my pre-wash with my regular diapers, get it all, and then I use little reusable kitchen towels in the kitchen when we're cleaning and wiping up messes and everything, and I toss those in in the second load. So I'm like double killing two birds with one stone there. But as it explains on the, the uh, screen here, peel and fluff between cycles, that's just to like make sure that your machine doesn't get flooded and weight, you know, um, unbalanced. <sighs> um, here it's explaining washing again, using the shortest cycle for your pre-wash that still actually goes through an entire wash. Um, and then the longest cycle for your main wash. Dum -da -dum -da -dum. <laughs> Troublemaker machines, these are usually because they don't let you adjust water levels um, and or um they just won't add enough water so you end up with like i don't want to say detergent buildup but detergent that hasn't rinsed out because you can't get enough water into your machine and people were like several years ago taking buckets of water and throwing it into their machine to try and trick it into fluffing their diapers but then that can cause errors on your machine hence the troublemakers machine list so what if I have stains? Staining is actually normal, especially for EVF babies um, because their poop is like yellow. Um, but stain removers are cloth safe, but also the sun is effective. And I live in Colorado. So I can tell you that I put things out in the sun and 30 minutes later, maybe, it might be 15 minutes, but I forget, um, it's gone. The sun, the UV rays, act as like a bleaching agent. And so um, then you can wet them and add lemon juice if it doesn't get it out the first time. Basic troubleshooting again with your suds errors and stinky diapers, getting more agitation in there. So the troubleshooting that comes with cloth is always wash routines because it's a very delicate balance. And um, I found though that the nose knows 
And I, I really like that as a saying. Ammonia, smelling ammonia in your pail. So um, we all know that smell. When you smell it on wash day, it's normal. Like when they've been sitting for a couple days, but if like your diapers, you've washed them and they come out and you put, especially like oh, if you put them in the dryer too, and then they come out and they all smell still like ammonia. No, you are not doing it right. Um, it's going to end up then causing ammonia burns on baby. Um, and so it says, see, see above suggestions for stinky diapers. Try rinsing overnight diapers in warm water every morning. That's what I do personally. Um, and it helps tremendously. So what you're doing when you're taking the diaper off immediately and rinsing it is breaking down the urine immediately with the water so that it can't turn into ammonia as oxygen hits it. Right. Um, troubleshooting, we can troubleshoot with leaks, um, with fit and absorbency and all of those things. Um, but that's a child by child basis. Um, and that's why our program's so awesome. <laughs> uh oh, baby has a rash. It does happen in cloth sometimes. Most rashes, you can use a CD safe cream, cloth diaper safe cream. Um, most of them are actually fine though. Um, you can use a liner to protect your diaper. The only thing that it would do is cause repelling. So your diapers might not absorb, um, which is why people do avoid the ones that are like petroleum based. Um, but personally, I love CJ's butter. They're here in Colorado also. And they're a shea butter and I use them for everything like my elbows and my lips when I get wind chap. Oh, yes. So, <laughs> um, it also covers yeast rash here, but um, usually typically yeast rashes come with a prescription from your prescriber. So, and then that is my information if anybody wants it, but any of our advocates can help. So now we're gonna roll into really quickly the impacts of the cloth option and how um, we have impacted the, that's not the right one. The scene, if you will, the diaper scene. And these are really quick, so. There we go. Oh no, I can't see. Oh, there it is. So these are, um, again, just summarizing we do these every month you can follow our page to find these infographics but with our cloth auction program um we loan a small supply of diapers of cloth diapers to um, any of our applicants and there are theirs to borrow for as long as they need them and then they return them when they're done um we just ask that they don't resell them they just return them to our, their advocate so what we're trying to do is reduce that upfront cost of cloth because that is the biggest barrier. Because 33 cents per diaper is a lot easier than $22 per diaper when you are going paying going paycheck to paycheck. Um, so we're here to cover that upfront cost and make cloth an option for anyone who wants to try it. So again, in January of 2021, we serviced 104 children with 1,560 cloth diapers distributed. That equals 312,000 disposable diapers replaced in January alone. We see those numbers again in February, 152 children served with 20, 280 cloth diapers distributed and 456,000 disposable diapers replaced. And then again in March, 139 children served with 2,085 cloth diapers serviced 4,000, four, sorry, 417,000, there we go, disposable diapers, numbers, <laughs> all right. And then 144 children served in April with 432,000 diapers, disposable diapers being replaced. This is our May one, I just pulled it up really quickly, but I love this one because it has our entire disposables replaced amount from our program total since January 1st of 2019, when we first distributed our first package to a recipient, we have replaced approximately 10,536,000 disposables. So that's like 5 million disposables a year. 
that, that we alone have impacted through our organization, not to mention all of the parents that already cloth diaper on their own. So um, we can make a difference with the numbers that Rosie presented. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Rebecca. So we do have a couple questions. So those are going to, we'll go to the Q&A at the end of all the presentations and we'll get a chance to discuss them at length. Uh, if you have any other questions about cloth diapers, you can use the pop-up Q&A box or put it in the chat and we will compile them at the end. Um, I'll also add some links to the Zoom chat for the cloth option too. So um, now we're going to shift gears and we're going to uh, talk pet waste with Rose Seaman, who has called in. So I've just allowed them to join. Let's see. I think, Rose, let's see if you can unmute on your end. There might be a button for you to push to unmute. Hope this works. <laughs> Hello? I think I'm unmuted. Hello. There you go. Yay, we've got Rose. Okay, <laughs> welcome Rose from the webinar. Pretty awesome. I'm here in Aurora and my um, Comcast internet has been down all day in Aurora. Oh, gosh. <clears throat> so I'm here with my little flip phone <laughs> trying to talk to you all about dog poop and uh, <clears throat> dog and cat poop. It's really not difficult to recycle. The problem is um, that composters do not want to recycle it because there are usually commingled plastic bags with the dog waste. And um, also, they just don't want to start something different, but they could throw it in with the compost and they all kind of know it, but they just don't even want to get into it. <clears throat> and the only reason why there isn't community um, pet waste composting along with other organic composting is because there just isn't any grassroots advocacy for it. Um, in Canada and in Australia, um, the communities do ask for it. They ask for um, RFPs um, so that they can um, choose a composter that will take the pet waste. Very difficult to find someone here who will do it. <clears throat> and right now, um, EnviroWag compost, composts about a quarter of a ton of dog waste um, a month from uh, boulder trailheads, dog parks, and dog daycare centers all along the Front Range. And uh, you might think there isn't a whole lot of dog waste. However, um, are you looking at the first slide here? Yes, I have it pulled up on the screen. Pretty cool. Uh, you can see that dog waste on the left, cat waste is on the right. I have no what idea why they made little soap bubbles for the cat waste, but when they did the infographic, this is how it turned out. We did all the math, and in Colorado's um, cities with populations greater than 30,000, and there are 19 of them, um, this is how much dog and cat waste goes into landfills in Colorado every year. It weighs as much as the Washington Monument plus 37 Statues of Liberty, and that's Colorado alone. So you can see that there's a, a great deal of um, dog and cat waste that goes into landfills here, and that's commingled with plastic bags, plastic pickup bags, and the plastic bags that um, cat litter is thrown into. Also clay litter goes into there too. <clears throat> so that's about 89,000 plus tons a year of dog and cat waste. And when this goes into a landfill, regardless of what kind of bag it's in, compostable, biodegradable, plastic, it doesn't matter. When it goes into a landfill, it just sits there. It doesn't decompose. It doesn't go into the ground, regardless of what all the plastic bag and biodegradable bag manufacturers say. Um, it emits methane, 
<clears throat> which is a powerful greenhouse gas. And um, about 14% of all the methane in the air comes from landfills at this point. So you can see that dog and cat waste really contributes a lot in terms of um, taking up landfill space and also um, emitting methane that goes into the air. So um, could I have the next slide? Yep, got it. Oh, good. This is our operation. It's at a place called Soil Rejuvenation, which is in fact in Longmont. And that pile of um, bags with dog waste in that you see on the left, uh, those are all bags that have been opened with a grinder. You can see in the back that there's, there's a, um, a loader that's putting it, onto a, um, putting it onto a conveyor belt that goes into there. The bags are ground up so that um, the air and the moisture can reach the dog waste. It's ground up and you see those little um, green and blue bags that are in there. Those are um, plastic. The black and the white ones are compostable. Now, when these are all ground up, they're put into a big tumbler and that's what you see on the left. It's called an in-vessel composter. Um, it's put into a chute on one end. It's the um, compost tumbler turns, and the other end, um, out of the other end comes finished, well, not finished compost, but compost that needs to kind of set for a while and season so that it can, can be used on plants. And um, <clears throat> we've been doing this in the tumbler for maybe five years now. And our purpose was to prove that um, there could be large scale composting of dog waste. And we, we've proved that. We've had it um, tested and it's tested um, safe by EPA, EPA standards um, for biosolids. And um, it's now being used on the property, which is a um, retail soils seller. And you can see trees around the perimeter there. And the dog waste compost is used on landscaping um, on that property at this point. And we're still collecting at all the places where, um, where we do collect. The collector is Pet Scoop, which is the biggest scooper service um, in Colorado. And people, um, contract with pet waste or pet scoop. Pet scoop comes and picks it up. And pet scoop also arranges for dog parks to be set up in such a way that there are separate bins for the dog waste and trash. And also makes sure that the um, dog parks that are doing the composting offer compostable bags. Compostable bags are a bit more expensive, but some communities feel that it's this is important enough to invest in these bags and to invest in having the dog waste transported here so that it can be um, so that it can be processed into compost that can go back to nature as opposed to in a landfill. So essentially we're diverting dog waste and making it into a nice product. Now at one point we did some test marketing to sell um, the tested compost at the end, and we called it doggone good compost and doggone good potting soil mix, mix. And we did try it in some garden centers in Colorado, and it was not a big seller because of the ick factor that's attached to dog waste. But we have done a number of tests on plants that are informal that show that it's a very, very good soil amendment for plants. It has a lot of nitrogen. It has a lot of phosphorus. And um, there are actually some people in various universities that are studying this and seeing you know, what kind of components are in this. 
and um, this place is available for any studies that that you know need to be done on large scale composting and also large scale disintegration of um, compostable bags. Um, so um, the last slide would be good. Okay, we've got it. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Yeah, I wrote a book five years ago called the Pet Poo Compost Guide, um, Pet Poo Pocket Guide, which talks all about safely recycling and composting dog waste in a do-it-yourself kind of situation at your home. And it's fairly easy to do. You can compost it like anything else. You can compost it with anything else, but you shouldn't use it on food, um, on food crops if there's pet waste compost in there because um, you might drop some fruit or drop some vegetables into it. It might not all wash out. It might not be totally finished. So you want to only use it on landscaping unless it's been done commercially the way we do it and have it tested. And all over the internet, if you um, search compost dog waste, all over the internet, you'll see um, all kinds of systems for doing this. When I first started about 10 years ago, there was really nothing online about it except for a couple of studies. But now so many people have tried it and so many people have solutions and they're pretty good ones that you can find all sorts of videos on how to do this. Now, cat waste is a different issue. You can compost cat waste. You just shouldn't flush it or you shouldn't, um, you shouldn't use it in a septic kind of system where it will drain into another waterway. Because if a cat is left outside and they catch rice, mice, and rats, then they can have toxoplasma. And this is a little um, microbe that's in their system. And toxoplasma can be bad for people with immune, um, with immunity problems with um, their immune systems. Um, women who are pregnant may have a low immunity and um, also um, water mammals like otters can be affected by it. Otherwise, it can be composted along with dog waste. And there are also other ways that you can um, handle dog waste. You can flush it down the toilet. The EPA says that it's okay to flush it. You can also vermicompost it, and that is using worms or a worm farm to compost it. And you can use Bokashi. I don't know if you're familiar with Bokashi, but there are ways to do it with Bokashi also. And it's all in this book. And there, there's a lot of it online too. The book kind of breaks it down and um, tells you um, if you have property, what to do, if you're an apartment, what to do, um, you know, and you know, various systems. If you wanna put a lot of effort into it, if you wanna put a little effort into it, kind of breaks it down very nicely into what you can do. And that's available at earthhero.com. And um, I think that's kind of like skimming the surface of the whole thing. So if you have any questions, just let me know. Thank you so much, Rose. So since we have Rose on call in tonight with limited connection, we will do a brief Q&A with her right now before she needs to hop off the call. We've got a couple of questions that came in. Um, Hazel asks, uh, I didn't realize that meat generated pet wastes from our domestic livestock is really useful for, for landscaping uses. Are there some plants that are better adapted to accept it? Um, no, actually all plants accept it. And if it's kept for a while, you really have to age all compost, let it sit for six months to a year, depending on the climate. And then it breaks down very nicely. We still haven't got a study, um, a university study on what kind of plants it works best on or a breakdown of all the nutrients. They're working on that in um, central Queensland University in Australia. Um, so we, we don't know exactly what plants 
work best on it. Just don't use it on food crops. All right. Uh, and then Sherry had two questions, but one of them I think you already answered, which was about flushing the dog poop down the toilet. Um, the other question is, if the pet poop compost is not being sold, what's being done with it? And, you know, kind of other distribution models if it's not being sold. It's not being sold and it's being used on the property where it's being composted. It's using it's being used for landscaping there. All right, um, so the compost, home? the comp going. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, distributing packaging and distributing compost is a um, is a very labor intensive and expensive process. Most compost is generated on huge um, composting at used huge composting facilities like a one over in Platteville. And there are a number of them up there in Weld County. Um, but doing a small amount of compost like we do and trying to sell it and bag it and all that, particularly considering the ick factor, is just not profitable or feasible at this point. So for the at um, the at home types of composting that you mentioned, um, could you speak just briefly about the Bokashi uh, method and also moldering? Oh, you know about moldering, huh? <laughs> um, moldering is that you just let it rot. You just put it aside somewhere where nobody's going to bother it. Um, put sawdust on it, throw some leaves on it, um, fence it off so no critters can get at it, and it will just molder after a while. It'll just become compost. It just takes a long, long time. Bokashi, on the other hand, is very fast, and you can do it two ways. Um, online, you'll find a Bokashi system. It's commercial. You have to buy the buckets and buy the stuff, and you do it in water, and you put Bokashi mix in, and you put it in water. A Bokashi will, will dissolve anything, even bones, and Bokashi is very powerful. It's got um, these little microbes that are like super, super microbes. So you can put it in buckets with water, and you can also kind of lasagna it. You put the dog waste down or you put any kind of food scraps or anything down in kind of a blocked off area on the ground and you put Bokashi over it and then you put another layer of um, organics on top and then you put more Bokashi in, on top of that and um, even dry the Bokashi, um, which is kind of like a dry powder, will eat into that. Bokashi is fascinating. It doesn't exactly degrade, but it kind of turns things into what look like a zombie image of itself, and then it just kind of collapses. It's it's um it's an unusual process, but there there's there are plenty of instructions online and in the book too about how to even make your own bokashi so that you don't have to buy it online. It's not hugely expensive, but it's so much less expensive to do it on your own, and it's a lot of fun. And there are a lot of videos um, on how to make Bokashi. Kids can even make it in big plastic swimming pools. And it's um, it, it's it's great way to sanitize things. You can put it. I mean, Bokashi has a million uses. So it's it's really something interesting to look into. Cool. Thank you. Um, so we have another question from Lauren. Um, are there any plans or future goals to expand the pet compost facility? No, not that facility. However, um, myself and three other people, two in San Francisco and one in Australia, are now working on organizing um, um, the Enviro Pet Waste Network. It's going to be online, and you're going to be able to go in there and talk to other people about how to do it. Mostly it's for communities, so that um, whole communities that want to do this and it's not just composting, it can be biodigesting, it can be other ways that communities can do this. They can go in and they can talk to each other. It's for people who are park supervisors and researchers and um, pet scoopers, dog daycares, anybody that wants to um, recycle their pet waste um, can join in and talk on this network. Oh, fantastic. Oh, are there... 
We'll look forward to that. End, Is that think, that's uh, being developed right now, you said, Rose? We're developing it and we should be it should be um, a nonprofit here in Colorado by the end of June. And then we're going national to make it a 501 um, C3. That, I think that takes a bit longer, maybe a lot longer. I don't know. Um, but we're going to do that at the end of June, too. And we should have the website up sometime in July. Uh, but, but, you know, in everything about networking and talking, it really just takes um, neighborhood advocacy. You have to go in there and you have to tell authorities that you want to do it. You have to go to city councils. Um, you have to go to your parks departments. And it always helps to do something for them so they do something for you. For instance, if there's a Friends of the Dog Parks and you want to do composting, you got to kind of have them trust that you're going to be there and you're going to help out, you know, by cleaning up the area or, you know, you've got to join hand in hand. You just can't expect them to do it. And you've got to put a lot of pressure on them and you've got enough had to have have to have enough people who want to do it, you know, or it, it just won't work out. Thank you, Rose, for staying on the line with us to do a little Q and A. Um, I've got one really quick question before you hop off. Um, we had at the top of uh, the hour talked briefly about um, clay kitty litter and why it doesn't break down. And uh, if you could just toss out a couple alternatives to clay for kitty litter before you uh, take off. That'd oh, there are, there are tons of. of <clears throat> compostable ones, but the best one and the cheapest one that I found is um, using those pellets, the um, animal bedding pellets. You can get them at any kind of um, store that sells um, bedding for horses and um, chickens and all that. Um, and it's really simple. The cat, it takes, a, the cat will get used to it. They really do. And when the cat urinates, it turns it into a kind of sawdust that can be picked up. Um, and then you can recycle the sawdust. Um, but, you know, that's inexpensive and it works. And others do too. There's some made of paper, some made of wheat. You know, they're all, all different forms of it. I don't think you can get, get it like at Costco and PetSmart, but you have to go to um, pet stores that have natural foods and that sort of thing to find it. The other thing is litter, the problem with clay litter is that it's strip mined. Mm -hmm. So it's not good for the environment to do it. They usually put all kinds of perfumes and chemicals in there that are not found in nature and that are supposed to be perfumed and the cat's supposed to like it and the cat sneezes and it's just not real good. Uh, also in some jurisdictions in Canada, they do accept clay litter and they do um, put it in with their composting and i guess when they do their um screening at the end they screen it out it doesn't compost but it can be workable oh great well thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and joining us by phone tonight rose and uh have a great evening i hope your internet comes Hi. back soon i hope so too <laughs> see you all later see you all Okay, bye bye. bye, -bye. Um, and then to round things off for the evening, I'm going to share some information about sustainable reusable menstrual products, specifically cloth pads, menstrual cups, and period underwear. On average, a person who has periods will menstruate for 2,500 days of their life, which works out to over six and a half years of continual menstrual product use. If they purchase single use options, they can go through up to 11,000 disposable pads or 14,000 tampons throughout their lifetime, which is just an incredible, incredible amount of waste. Rosie touched upon what this looks like at a national scale and their longevity in our landfills. Uh, and one of those estimates that's tossed out is that pads and tampons take 
estimated 500 years to degrade. But as Rosie said, we don't really know. We're guessing because we haven't had them for 500 years. Uh, as they do degrade, they leach out toxic chemicals. Disposable pads contain a variety of plastics from the leak-proof base to synthetics that soak up the fluid to the packaging itself, as well as polyethylene, the adhesive that's used to make the pads stick to your underwear. And then tampons come wrapped in plastic, often encased in those plastic applicators that we saw earlier, and many even include a thin layer of plastic in the absorbent part. Most tampons also contain chemicals such as dioxin, chlorine, and rayon. And in the use of these products, we're exposing ourselves to these plastics and chemicals. The labia and vaginal area is highly vascular, meaning that a lot of small blood vessels run to this area. The skin is also especially thin down there, making it easier for these plastic chemicals to enter our bodies. And then when single use menstrual products sit in the landfills, these chemicals slowly decompose and re are released as pollution into the earth, the groundwater and the air. Single use menstrual products are also financially costly. They, the average person who has periods would spend between 100 to $150 each year on tampons or pads. Cloth pads can be made at home for free out of upcycled clothes, blankets, and towels, or purchased in sets that will last for years. Um, I bought my first sets of cloth pads in 2011 and 2013, and I still have most of the pads from these sets in my monthly rotation. Um, they last, and you can always make more if you're inclined to do so. On average, a menstrual cup will cost between $20 to $40 and can last up to 10 years. So I'm gonna start off with the cloth pads since they're very similar to the cloth diapers, which Rebecca covered extensively in her presentation. In fact, the cloth option has resources and guides around cloth pads as well. And the materials and construction might look familiar to you if you <laughs> had seen them earlier when we were talking about diapers. The top layer, I prefer 100% organic cotton jersey or flannel, which are both comfortable and breathable. The middle layer will be for absorption and light day or liner pads don't even need this middle layer. With fabrics such as hemp and bamboo, a very absorbent pad can be made really thin because they're highly absorbent materials. Uh, for the bottom layer, you could use waterproof or water resistant materials such as a polyurethane laminate pole fabric, but if you're avoiding all synthetics, you can also use thick wool or cotton fleece. There's also a specialty fabric called Zorb. Uh, it's pictured in that center right here, the, the weird bumpy <laughs> fabric in the middle of that picture of the uh, deconstructed pad. Uh, it's a dimpled organic cotton on the top, and then there's a water resistant polyurethane laminate in the core and polyester fabric for moisture wicking on the bottom. It's designed for maximum absorbency and protection and used in oftentimes in cloth diapers and pads. And then uh, your cloth pads are usually finished off with uh, snaps, you know, or Velcro on the wings that hold them in place. And, you know, like I said, I've had these for years and years and the snaps are really solid in there. Um, there are tons of free tutorials online if you're interested in making your own pads. And I'll, I'll include some links in a follow-up email to everyone who registered for this webinar. There is also a Facebook group called Sew Cloth Pads that's just for tutorials and resource sharing. If you prefer to buy your cloth pads, there are so many online vendors that use a variety of sustainable materials. And I personally like shopping on Etsy for cloth pads because it also supports individual entrepreneurs. For cleaning your pads, you can use similar methods to cloth diapers. To prevent staining, I like starting either with a cold water rinse or a cold water soak until I'm ready to launder them. You could soak it in a bucket or tub or in your sink. And then baking soda can also help for persistent stains before you launder. Uh, and then if you dry out in the sun, as Rebecca had mentioned here in Colorado, that's also very effective. You can toss your pads in with your regular wash, um, but just as with diapers, it's recommended that you don't use fabric softener because it can um, affect future moisture absorption. If you buy your pads, they likely will come with some kind of wash and care instructions, and there are many guides also available for free online. 
period underwear is very similar to cloth pads. Uh, the various materials are simply built into the underwear itself. Like cloth pads, the style of underwear has different layers for moisture wicking on top, absorbency, and then moisture protection to prevent flow from reaching your clothing. Like pads, they come in a range of absorbency for different times of your cycle. And period underwear can usually last up to a day, depending on the style and your flow. You can also pair them with menstrual cups for an extra layer of protection on your heavier days. And now menstrual cups. Most menstrual cups are made of medical grade silicone. They're uh, derived from quartz sand, the second most abundant mineral in the earth's crust. And they're flexible, like you kind of bend them when you uh, insert them. Um, they're, uh, they're also hypoallergenic and durable. As I said, they can last uh, up to 10 years. They're also safer than tampons because you're not at risk of getting toxic shock syndrome, TSS, a bacterial infection that's uh, often associated with tampon use. Tampons are typically changed every four to six hours, depending on your flow, and should not be worn more than eight hours due to the toxic, toxic shock syndrome risk. But menstrual cups can stay in for longer. They're good for overnight protection. You can wear one up to 12 hours and in any other situation when you might otherwise want to wear a tampon. Uh, this is a little comparison, size comparison provided by one of the uh, cup producers. So a menstrual cup can hold up to about one to two ounces of menstrual flow, depending on the size. Tampons, on the other hand, can only hold about a third of an ounce on average. And even super absorbent tampons or pads can, can't hold more than half an ounce. So again, don't have to change, you know, change this out as often, don't have to um, worry as much about leakage. And <clears throat> most menstrual cups will come in a variety of sizes, at least small and large. Um, smaller menstrual cups are usually recommended for people younger than 30 years old or who haven't given birth vaginally. And larger sizes are often recommended for people who are older, have given birth vaginally or have heavier periods. So uh, if you are confused about which one you should get, you can also talk to your gynecologist about what cup size they would recommend for you. And every major brand of menstrual cup has guidelines on its website for sizing, as well as really detailed instructions on how to insert and wear the cup and cleaning instructions. So there's a lot of great online resources if you're curious about learning more about the, the ins and outs of using a menstrual cup. Uh, finally, I just really wanted to briefly touch on bidets as a way to eliminate toilet paper waste from your waste stream since we're talking about waste streams. Uh, bidets use a spray of water to wash rather than wipe, providing a more thorough and sanitary solution than toilet paper. And perhaps surprisingly, they also use less water than the manufacturing of toilet paper. A single roll of toilet paper requires 37 gallons of water to manufacture, 1.3 kilowatt hours of electricity, and one and a half pounds of wood. That's for one roll of toilet paper. <laughs> Americans use 36.5 billion rolls of toilet pa paper every year, which represents the pulping of 15 million trees. Their manufacture also requires 4.7 billion gallon, gallons of water, 17.3 terawatts of electricity, and use 253,000 tons of chlorine for bleaching. You can go zero waste with a bidet by using cloth wipes for drying off, which uh, just like cloth pads, you can either purchase or make yourself from repurposed old clothes or blankets. All right, so I kind of went through that as quickly as possible because I wanted time for Q&A at the end. Um, we do have some questions that have come in. Uh, first from Hazel, we have a question for uh, Rebecca. We were, had some questions about, do you have any advice or resources for adult size cloth diapers? Hazel asked, what about diapers for the elderly? Does the industry manufacture different types of non-disposables? And um, I've only seen ads for nylon type washable panties and was wondering how popular they are or if uh, anyone is really aware of their existence. <laughs> Well, so I'll go ahead and address that. Um, as far as the cloth and the elderly, we, ha we haven't gotten there yet, we're working on it. And I wanted to talk though about what we are, what the progress we have made, um, because this one is a size three cover. 
and it goes up to 65 pounds. And then they just released a size four cover that I think goes up to 85 pounds. So we're getting there. It's just, it takes a lot of plastic material to make because the, the easy part is the absorption. Like we can make um, enough absorbency inside for an adult diaper. It's getting the size of an adult, especially getting up into like a 200, 200 plus pound adult um, is where it gets tricky. <clears throat> Great. Um, let me see. We have uh, for Rosie. Um, oh, I wanted to ask you for people who want to get more involved in the zero waste movement. Can you share a little information about the Eco Leader program with EcoCycle? Yes. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, so yeah, the Eco Leader program is what our organization was founded on because it was a, a grassroots movement way back in 1976. Um, so if you are someone who is interested in zero waste and trying to do better for yourself and also to educate your networks, which you are if you're watching this video, um, uh, you can join the EcoLeader Network, which is just um, about a thousand of folks exactly like you, um, not exactly like you, but with those same goals and interests across Boulder County and Broomfield. And so all it entails is um, you sign up and then I train you on the guidelines so that you're an expert on what goes in recycling and compost and even hard to recycle. Um, and then you really just use that information however makes sense to you. So whether it's like being really involved in you know, creating a hard to recycle event collection um, in your neighborhood or you know, starting a green team in your office or just kind of being more like, I know the information and if it comes up naturally, like I'll tell my friends, I'll answer their questions, I'll help someone in Whole Foods who's struggling over the bins. Um, it's really anywhere in the spectrum. And so I'll put um, the link to sign up in the chat box. We'd love to have you. Great, thank you, Rosie. Um, this question comes from Sherry. Uh, re regarding menstrual fluid, any tips for mitigating outdoor or, or mitigating odors for cloth and how to deal with swimming, hiking, and camping? So um, for cloth mitigating odors, um, I mean, the frequency with which you change your paths can help mitigate odors, but um, also the absorbency material that's in the, that center layer. Uh, and then, yeah, immediately putting them into cold water. And if you find there are smells of uh, vinegar is another, you know, doing a little pre-wash with vinegar can also help. I don't know, Rebecca, do you have uh, additional tips? I know you have similar questions with diapers. I was going to say, no, I, I think you, you covered a lot, but I would say that um, from the swimming, hiking, camping component, that's actually why I found menstrual cups in the first place. Um, so is yeah. that you, those, you know, those uh, activities where you might otherwise use a tampon? Yeah, swimming, hiking. Right bike riding, whatever, it, it definitely helps. And I, I haven't yet actually tried the uh, period underwear as well, but I, I hear that, you know, they, you can get them in different absorbency and that can be kind of a seamless uh, transition to, to, to give you a little extra pro protection too, if you're worried. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Rebecca, can you share yes. a little more about the cloth options diaper assistance program? Yes, absolutely. So with our diaper assistance program, again, um, you, when you're asked to apply, we don't ask for any income requirements. Um, we ask specifically, we're asking, making sure that you don't already have enough cloth diapers to cloth diaper a child. Then we're also checking to make sure that a child actually exists. It's all just like those types of things when you apply, but then we supply you with, depending on whatever each advocate has, um, enough diapers to, we do a newborn loan. I should start that way. We do a newborn loan because like I discussed, newborns do need more diapers. They also require a different size. One size, our, our cloth diapers adjust in sizes, but um, they start off, the newborn is really small. So we send like a newborn package. And then when they return that, we can send them the next package that grows with baby. Um, so that first newborn package usually includes more changes. Um, up um, 20 changes for a newborn and then we go down to 15 changes for an infant um, but again 20 changes is enough to last at least a day um, but actually even more um, and get it getting get you washing and then hopefully if everything's going well 
The other part of our program is that because there are so many different styles of cloth, you get to learn what really truly works for you um, at no cost to you. Because again, like we've discussed, there are diapers that, so there are diapers that are made in China, for example, that are made significantly cheaper because we're not taking on any of the environmental costs um, or fair labor costs. So you can get them really cheap, but their quality is not that great. And so they end up actually as a plastic going to eco cycle. But these higher quality ones that we make in America, they're also providing fair labor and jobs in Colorado, in Loveland here. Um, so, and um, making super cute prints oh. too. I specifically picked this one because it's um, environmentalist. But yeah, I love so the variety of prints and stuff you can get with these products. They're really right. cute and fun. <laughs> and you can make exactly get creative with them. And so in providing though that different style of options, we again like you can try out a couple things and say, oh yeah, I was really hesitant. I'm gonna back up to say that when people are reading about cloth, their perception of what they think they'll like and what they end up liking are usually two completely different things. Sometimes they are the same, but a lot of times, at least for me, I ended up falling, like starting with one kind and being like, actually, uh, nope, don't, nope. Oh, this is the kind I like. So we, we also provide that as well as support, weekly support. You can drop in and talk to us um, on a chat or email us for wash routines. Um, yeah, we also provide water testing supplies to test your hard water. Oh, wow. And I think you touched on, I have, I have a whole bunch of items. Like I have my little uh, reusable menstrual kit. I have like cloth wipes. Um, and then here, actually I have some, I think we talked about wool. This is a little tiny newborn wool one. Um, but then we talked about um, wet bags. And so mm -hmm. the other thing is with wet bags and camping, you can put your wet stuff in here. That's what I do. I have a wet bag hanging from where my toilet paper dispenser thinks I should put toilet paper. And that's where we put our used cloth wipes and used menstrual beds and things like that after I rinse them. Um, and so, yeah, that's also a great way to combat the smell in camping. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Well, I know we had a little bit of a technical snafu, but we are getting to the end of our time together this evening. Um, I'm just going to do a quick screen share to go over our zero waste resources from tonight. Um, these, uh, these resources uh, will be in the, the links will be in uh, the today's webinar when we put it on YouTube. Uh, it'll be posted alongside our video on our YouTube channel, in addition to the Facebook Live video page. And I will also send these links in a follow up email to everyone who registered for this webinar tonight. And so, yeah, EcoCycle, become an eco leader. That's uh, what Rosie talked about there at the end. Cloth Option Facebook page, and there's some more resources on cloth diapers, EnviroWag, and the poo, uh, Pet Poo Pocket Guide. Extensive cloth pad resources are at that website, uh, clothpads.wordpress. And of course, you can join SRL's Zero Waste Committee for additional zero waste resources and ongoing future events. If, uh, let me, let's go there. There we go. That's my final slide for the evening. If you would like to get involved with Sustainable Resilient Longmont and the Zero Waste Committee, you can find us at srlongmont.org and on Facebook. You can find our full series of zero waste webinars from the past year on our YouTube channel. We are a community run nonprofit and rely on donations and grants. So if you're able to donate, we deeply appreciate your support. Thank you everyone who joined us for this webinar. A huge, huge thank you to our panelists, Rosie, Rebecca, and Rose for all the information and expertise you shared with us today. And take care everyone and have a wonderful summer.